All right, so we had five groups, so um, we've allocated about 20 minutes per group for the report back. Some groups may not need as long, some may not, some may take as longer than that. I, I never, I, you know, after X17 IATs, I never hazard a guess anymore on what will take longer and what won't. Um, I, why don't I go first with the group where we looked at goals, um, just to, so I can get done and then so we looked at USCDI. I'll make this bigger. And we looked at what FIRE does um, in the SDOH. So USCDI um, V1 had patient goal. USCDI V2 had the SDOH goal. So we looked at the Gravity Health FIRE IG to see what they did. Ryan had talked about how, so in the companion guide for SDOH goal, um, the code for the goal observation is fixed to 8689-2, history of social function. They have uh, uh, his organization for person patient goals, so the other, um, they've chosen a code, 87528-6, personal health goal. goal. Um, we're, that's what we're suggesting as the example uh, to be used. Um, seems when we looked at one codes, that seems to be right, a reasonable goal. One of the problems is that for the patient goal, the USCDI has no description of a patient goal, unlike the other elements where they've got information about what those are. So, um, you know, so there's no code for it. And the other thing too is it's when they say patient goal, is that where the author of the goal, is it a patient authored goal or does it, is it allowed for provider specified goals for a patient in the patient goal category? We don't know because there's no description there. So what we did for our example, is we created an overarching uh, SDOH goal. So patient to find decent housing. So that's the text of the entry. We use um, this SNOMED code. It's in, so Gravity has defined a set of um, a value set at VSAC that is the SDOH um, observation value goal um, codes. So we use that one. It's a patient centric code in the sense that the patient has identified it as a goal so that you can assume this is a pointer to the record target. And then it has two sub goals in it. And it was, a, we noted that fire doesn't actually allow a goal to have sub goals, a component goal, that was interesting. But we have another um, SDOH. So yeah, that's that tells us it's an SD, for patient to get a steady job. So employed finding, so that's another um, SDOH goal. So that's a milestone of that top one. And then we had a, a second, milestone goal, which is not an SDOH, so a personal health goal. So that's the code we used. And in this case, we didn't have a code because it's just text. So identify three suitable apartment complexes. Again, because USCDI doesn't have much description, it's basically, you could use a code here. And what we found is, you know, if you used a code that was in the SDOH value set, then it's a struct, then it's an SDOH goal, if you used any other code, then it's a personal health goal. That's really all we have as a basis. And then this goal has got a component activity in it. So it's pointing to an activity um, using the um, entry relationship. And basically this idea is, you know, activity to meet with a housing coordinator. We wanted to show a little bit of that complexity. Strangely enough, FIRE doesn't allow you to do that. And we don't see a way of pointing from activities to the goal either. So whether it's, it's gotta be tied up in the care plan and Becky is gonna create a couple fire issues from things that you can do in CCDA that you can't do in fire. So it was um, it was a good session. I mean, it was just the three of us, Ryan, Becky and I, but we, we really understood how to make the example. We're gonna bring, I'm, we're gonna bring this example forward to the examples task force to add into the goals section. And um, like I said, there's a couple, um, uh, tracker items on the fire side we're going to make. And then we've got a couple um, recommendations around patient goals. A, that USCDI needs to make some, make some clarifications, but also that we should potentially have a fixed code for patient goals as well.
Any questions or comments? Jean, so again, you're here. Can we get a uh, copy of that example for the notes, please? Yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you. John, I'll tell you, I was only half listening, so I, I, I apologize if you did answer this already, but did you guys talk about this notion of shared goals? Um, like a provider patient shared goal? Yeah. Yeah, we talked about um, in the author participation section. I mean, there is guidance in the templates, right? That a patient centric goal. So this would point to the patient. If it was a provider, this would point to the provider or be the information. Yep. And if you had both, if you repeated it once to point to the patient, then it would be that shared goal or the negotiated goal, they call it in the template. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we thought of maybe changing one of these in the example just to point to a provider, but in, you know, in the sort of the goal that we came up with, the, the, the use case, you know, we, we basically had this patient had decided they need to find decent, yeah. decent housing. So, yeah. yeah, it didn't seem to be that problematic. I mean, the guidance in the template seemed to be quite clear. So we yeah. did look again at fire where fire's got the subject of the goal which is you know would be the patient in this case and then the the author not it's not author it's um entered by becky or ryan i have it up remember? somewhere i have it up yeah um can't remember the what subject called. is who the goal is intended for and fire expressed by is who's expressed responsible by. for right. creating the goal right so yeah so the expressed by would be the pay, can be a patient or could be a practitioner and so that, yeah and i should add lisa we focused mainly on the patient related goals being the subject because that's what us core has and then all, so we used us core and us cdi sort of as our guidance for it and then mm -hmm. tried to mesh mm -hmm. it with fire as well and that's where the goal has to be for the patient in order to be compliant with us cdi we we actually also looked at um, the social determinants of health implementation guide that gravity created and the same thing there, like the patient has to be the subject of the goal in order to be compliant. Yeah, so I, we, I think the patient has to be the subject of the goal, but what I'm getting at is in patient care, they spend a lot of time talking about goals that are set by patients versus goals that are set by the, by the practitioner. Right. And right. then the idea of a shared goal. And so I didn't know if you guys, you know, have, have been thinking that way and think about applying it that way to express. Um, right. I mean, I, we did I go, talk about I've whether. I've never had experience where I would say that I'd come away from my appointment with my physical therapist or my primary care physician and say, do we have, do, do, did I express a goal of mine? Did the doctor had a goal for me or did we talk about shared goals? <laughs> it, right. it seems very awkward, but. Yeah, like we did, I, I raised the one of um, where I, I come into my doctor and say, I want to lose weight. So I want to get to 180 pounds. So there's a patient goal. And my doctor says, that's a great idea. But while you're doing that, I need you to reduce your cholesterol. So that's a provider goal of, you know, get your, you know, again, subject is me in both cases. The provider's like, I need you to, you know, when you're losing weight, I need you to focus on also losing your cholesterol, lowering your cholesterol or hemoglobin or what have you, right? Uh -huh. Diabetic or something yep. like that. Yeah. And we also talked about from, you know, again, a, a dietitian side, we may have a goal that if we have a diabetic patient, especially like a new diabetic patient, we want them to decrease their hemoglobin A1C. And so that might be a goal that we have for them. But then as we educate a diabetic patient, they're given a list if they're doing like a um, diabetes self-management education course, they're given a list of possibly six goals that they want to work towards. And they're things like reducing stress level, um, regularly measuring their blood glucose levels, car uh, eating properly and counting their carbohydrates, physical activity, and they can't remember what the last one is. So the patient focuses on one thing, but the provider overall is focusing on making sure that their hemoglobin A1C comes down via the activities that the patient is doing. But we didn't do that as an example. Right. That would be a good one. I mean, I don't know if the patterns are set enough, Becky, that you could even, <clears throat> um, you know, maybe easily copy this and, and morph it a little bit now that Jean has the XML laid down. 
maybe maybe that would be a possibility. But I'm trying to find spots. I think I had one primary care physician once who actually at the end of my appointment, I always ask for my visit summary, and I read it, and I was like, wow, she actually wrote down what we talked about at the end. And one of the things was, um, you know, I don't sleep very well, and so I take this medication that's called Ambien that helps you sleep. She's like, I don't want you taking that. That stuff, you're never going to have a brain when you get old. <laughs> you need to not take that. And, and we need to figure out how to meditate, how to do other things. Um, but she clearly had a goal to get me to a place where I didn't take that medication anymore. And, 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 it, and it was in the record that she talked to me about it. So I was like, oh, man, she's serious about that. And so I got busy thinking about other ways to figure out how to deal with my sleep patterns and, and got off from it. So there definitely are real stories out there, but I think we just need to find them, mm-hmm. write them down, and then show how, how this XML can represent what's real, what's right. really out yep. there. No, I agree. Sure. I think, again, the, the main thing is that the USCDI, you know, this idea that they all they have is patient goal with no description. We need yeah. to go back. I think one of the action items would be to go back to whoever wants to is to go back to USCDI and say, look, you got to give us a bit more info than that because we've, here's some examples of patient centric goals, but they can be pro- provider led or patient led. And so what do you mean when you say patient goal? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think there is some hesitancy to the really encode the goals. Um, just because, um, I mean, you know, definitely encode it to the extent that you know it's a goal from mm-hmm. you know, a comfortable perspective. But um, you know, there's uh, hesitancy to get much beyond that because you you, know, you want to have such flexibility in what those goals are. Sure. Yeah. And One the reason the things- why we chose oh I was gonna say the reason why we chose the social determinants of health goal was that was one of Ryan's issues not to put you on the spot Ryan but he said we're trying to code this to meet US CDI so he wanted to walk through the example and he provided us with the SNOMED code that he's been using in his testing for housing adequate and you know my brain had to sort of redirect itself for a moment because when I'm reading housing adequate I'm like well that's really that's what we want to happen so I when you look at the value set that gravity has out there for the social determinants all of the goals are the positive thing that you want to have happen and so that's what you're actually that's your outcome that you want to hit which to me ends up being almost your overarching goal and you have to have all sub goals so that's why we ended up doing sub goals as well right so yeah. is that where a qualifier would go on as a sub goal like let's say that an a that a patient has a an a1c of 12 which is obviously you know high um you know, in everybody, you want to get down to seven, but but not everybody's goal would be to lower HA1C to seven. Could you have a sub goal to say, hey, in the next six months, we want to get it down to 10, let's say? Yeah, and it wouldn't be qualifiers. I mean, the, well, it could be, but the goal observation has components, has these milestones. So okay. it has already built in in CCDA the ability to go, okay, you know, the overarching goal is, you know, below seven, but, you know, in the next three months, we'll get it down below nine. Mm-hmm. And we'll also do some other things, you know, you need to start exercising and you need to start eating better and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, then we'll get it down to seven, you know, a year from now. So those yeah, are not like qualify. I mean, well, no, they're, they're milestone qualified. goals. So they've got, it's got this whole entry relationship capability right. to say, here's all of the milestones. Component. Like a pathway, like a, a path mm-hmm. to the goal too. Yeah, yep. exactly. So here's your, uh, your, here's your component goals that would all meet that. Yeah. So in our case, right, the, this this patient's looking for house uh, adequate housing, and so the first thing is they need to get a steady job. So they've got a you know an SDH for an employee, and we thought of other things. You could again, you could have potentially have you know milestones inside of this milestone. Um, you know, you, you got to you know search three, find three different employers. You've got to you know whatever, um, but we didn't go to that level of detail. Whereas in here, for instance. Um, you know, personal health goal of identify three suitable apartment complexes. So A, get a job, find three places that you want to go, and then that will lead towards adequate housing. And obviously you'd have way more, potentially way more component, or you could have way more. All right. 
That's awesome. And like even I think there's a, a over emphasis on trying to get every little knit and and semantic thing recorded. We you know we try to do that, but in this case, like the one of the ones you had was around the three find three um, places that you could live, right? Identify three suitable apartment complexes. There's at this point in time, it would be crazy to try to in, encode that information at a deeper level. And at some point, the fact that you could even potentially know that there's a personal goal right there, you go pick up that text and show it to somebody. What did Rob say the other day? The most important, one of the most important interoperability actors is the human. Yeah. You know? They 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 get the information they need. They say, "What is this patient's goal? Uh, they want to identify three suitable apartment complexes. The fact that we could make a computer do that would be amazing." <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's the uh, how to record a goal breakout session. Who would like to go next? How about the morning session of, uh, yeah, uh, Dee Dee and Brett? You guys did do a little bit of a discussion this morning, but uh, how about um, we'll put you guys on the spot and see where you guys got and what your next steps and such are. Uh, sure, John, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think to give you the, the, the part where, so on Legal Authenticator, um, uh, there's not a there's it's actually funny the example portion of this is not going to be hard when it comes to it because i don't think it's going to vary much from what we've already seen um, but the question we split into two um the first kind of question was about um do we want to add guidance to the companion guide or other hl7 ig that uh, documents um that once a document leaves the organization organizational boundary that it shall have a legal authenticator uh and the consensus in the group was yes we, we do want to do that um and the reason is, is the kind of current modeling, both in base CDA and in the consolidated CDA, is it's just, a sh you know, a cardinality is either zero to one or a should. And so it leaves questions for folks who, you know, don't dig in the spec of what does that mean? And we don't actually have language um, in kind of consolidated CDA to state that, you know, when you shall have it. And so this was a thing that, you know, we went back and forth on and agreed, yeah, it's, we sh you shall have this. Um, but then the stickier part of the conversation was who's the right person to put in there. Um, and, you know, part of it was, you know, clinicians, you know, uh, you know, the concern expressed about sometimes uh, they haven't, you know, fully signed the encounter. Um, they may have completed their notes, but haven't signed off the entire encounter. And that could be shared with someone else uh, to an external body. So who's the appropriate legal authenticator. And I guess maybe the bigger concern is, um, the documents actually being generated. So it's not just the clinician kind of walking through an authoring all section and signing it, as you would imagine in a paper world, uh, but it's, you know, the system assembling all sorts of content from various sources and that the provider not being comfortable having their name being associated with everything since they didn't actually do everything. Um, and so we did start the conversation on that and I'll put what we put in there in the chat too, um, with the idea of saying, you know, it could be the HMI, sorry, HIM director um, or other name kind of default user, the health information management kind of records management uh, uh, person, maybe the system that aggregated data or a provider that completed the encounter and signed off. If, it, if the provider did complete the whole thing and it was just as purely an encounter note, maybe the whole thing could be a provider. Um, but these are a few of the things that we considered. I think there are others and that the idea of this work, and I think it's kind of a follow up. I know Didi's not, Didi must not, is not here. I think eHealth Exchange has a call yeah. right now. But yeah, she's here. She, Oh, she's here. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say, well, Didi's not here. Let's assign it to her usability work group. But Didi <laughs> can, can comment on whether that's the appropriate totally next step, step or, or where it should go. If Didi doesn't get off mute, that'll be the. Uh, yes, I am oh, there here. She is. I am here. <laughs> um, hopefully, you guys can hear me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah we can. I am happy to continue. I can. I am happy to continue the discussion in the data usability work group because I did promise to also uh, leverage our legal attorney to see if there's any legal ramifications that we've got to think about for jurisdictional law and things. 
um, like that. But I'm happy to continue the discussion. It is a work item that we are looking at a future roadmap for. We are not going to include it in our draft IG, but I, I want to work closely with HL7 because I do think that if we're going to um, edit the companion guide or another, you know, specification in some way to strengthen the shall part, I think some additional guidance would work well there. Um, I'm expecting to have those conversations between now and June time frame. So I'll be bringing back information in, from the data usability work group uh, based on the clinician input. But I know that my two co-chairs who are practicing physicians were very much in favor of us trying to champion this up because they did feel like the legal authenticator does help engender trust in the document itself that they receive, that they're trusted that there was somebody accountable that they could follow up with. Uh, and even if it is an HIM director, at least they know somewhere to start. Um, so they felt that it would be very beneficial to include Shao. I'm happy to, to do that. Um, but I, I think I'm just looking for guidance. Do I need to coordinate? I, of course, being on the CDA management uh, group, I'll, I'll bring the information there and I'll work with, you know, with all of us to figure out do we bring it back to structured documents and how does it impact fire in the future? I think this is something that we can unpack and, and have some other tentacles that, that spring up at some point. Okay, good. Anything else on that one, or? No, I think, I think this is an action item that we're yeah. going to be tracking, um, obviously. Sure. Um, yeah. I and I see Brett, you put in the chat. Uh, so me Jiginu, if I'm wrong. Yeah, Jiginu, Brett put in the chat the two questions that they considered and answered. So, or started to answer. Good. All right. Um, Next, we had, let me go to the chat again. We had the, um, you guys met in the second half. So vocabulary grouping. Okay, and David, yes, you're here. How did that go? Sounded, when I joined in, it sounded like you guys were making fantastic progress. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if, uh, where's, wait, who's here? Oh, David? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Rob is, I think, still on the, uh, call his call vocab call. He emailed me at like three twenty five to get the example, which I didn't email him till four. But I, he said he found it anyway, so okay. that was good. But we haven't I haven't heard back yet, and obviously he's not doesn't seem to be out of the meeting yet as far as what their decision or discussion was. Yeah, they're not, they're still talking about it probably. No, <laughs> Um, but anyways, yeah, we did. We, I don't know if you want to to show the example we kind of walked away with, or if you happen to do any more, if you happen to use that stuff that I sent you to make new example. Uh, I, I have the one off of our thing, our, okay. our, our what we have checked in. Let me share. So uh, kind of in our discussions, we Rob is bringing this example to vocab right now. <laughs> it could be talking about it at this very moment where having uh, a third party code, in this case, uh, it's, it's IMO, even though we kind of obscure it here, uh, as a translation on the uh, SNOMED that it pertains to, and then within the translation qualifiers for the ICD-10 codes that. Uh, well, there are qualifiers, qualifiers, qualifiers for the IMO code that happen so to be. Qualifiers for IMO code, which is why it's within the translation and not a child of the value. Uh, so we, and even Rob agreed, uh, he was always like, I've never, we've never really talked about or seen you know, use it like this, but he agreed it could be done, and that's what he's bringing over vocab today. Uh, we also have this example up here where we put qualifiers of ICD-10s under another ICD-10, and I think uh, we're probably going to uh, try to bring that up at 
examples task force to get this removed. So uh, I don't know, are we meeting next Thursday? Is that not canceled or canceled? Uh, right. I think it's on the books right now. Yeah. Okay. So if we, I don't know if you can get that on the agenda. I think we're going to want to vote this out of the, this example. Yeah. And I, I might, if I have time, maybe I'll put the, the example together with the one I know they share with their customers. Yeah. The, <laughs> that more complicated the, one. The change. I, I think it's about the same as this one. It's just, yeah, it's, it's exactly what they're, yeah, if you have, I, I and have. it has the SNOMED thing too, right? So hey, hey, hey guys, I'm here. And actually I was just sent a document from Anne that says what their current guidance is, although I haven't read it. <laughs> but it is supposed to be, I showed this, and it's supposed to be consistent with um, the, uh, the part below. Yeah, well, I guess the whole thing, but particularly that, yeah. Okay. Glad right, they've right, changed it. It is consistent with this. That part that was just highlighted. Are you yeah. displaying? So, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it is consistent with that. Really. But I, within the I, last year. In the yeah. past year, right? Now, oh. like I said, I haven't read the document, <laughs> but but that was the take home. Actually. I'll, I'll be honest. She she said, "Oh, but we simplified it." So that's so. <laughs> well, we'll oh, see so, what that means. No, so they're yeah. probably not doing this. They're doing what I had recommend. You know, what the very first way that vocab and and I proposed. And no, and, I God, I hope not. I well, I asked are. her if I can send this out, and so uh, and yeah, it's more complicated than I can look at instantly, but. I hope it's, she said it's consistent with this highlighted part, but she did say she simplified it. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> Whatever I that means. So I'd be interested in seeing that you. quickly, to be honest. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, if, I mean, I'd be interested in seeing it. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I have asked if I can send that on. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, that'd be cool if they do. I mean, you know. Yeah, and I, and I can say that no surprise, I guess, that the vocab gr group got their shorts all twisted in a knot when I started <laughs> talking about this. So, um, but I am comfortable that this is actually reflecting the discussions. Carol and I remembered that this is what we talked about doing before, and I, I think it's the best we can do. So, yeah. And you still agree, obviously, we do want to remove this next week that officially. yeah the idea that you can um have you can build an expression which is the key difference here is yes not something that we agree with right now from an icd-10 and put icd-10s under it correct right oh sorry yeah snowmed yeah. because it's defined but yes yeah not but for, yeah, for, not, yeah. This, uh, yeah for right. a code system that does not explicitly describe how to do that you can't yeah so, and I asked Brett to put that on examples task force next week. To, yeah. We can vote that out of there. Okay. So I think that's where we stand. As I asked uh, John earlier, Dave, could you send me those examples for inclusion in the notes? Oh, these are on the examples task force. Yeah, yeah, just send them a link. Are, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll just, put it, this in chat. In I'll put this in the chat right now. There you go. And uh, just just to make sure, you know. So, and I put that <laughs> in the chat also to be clear what we're yeah. getting rid of. So, all right, I'll, uh, we can now uh, move on, I think. All right, um, one, two, three, let's uh, go to the unsuccessful procedure group. 
Matt, you guys finished early, so. Yes. Um, so we spent a little bit of time talking about uh, how we wanted to model that in CDA. Um, and if you give me a moment here, I'll uh, pull that up. So it pretty much was a continuation of the discussion that we had yesterday where uh, we ended up saying an agreement that um, adding an entry relationship to a procedure uh, with this custom act. Um, and this was the code that uh, Gay found, thank you, Gay, uh, that we sort of landed on as uh, the best way to indicate that uh, the procedure was unsuccessful. The other nice thing about uh, sticking this in an act in an entry relationship is that uh, there's a bunch of other metadata that you can include um, if you're so inclined. Uh, so that's a plus. Um, and then the discussion sort of shifted to, we agree that uh, having an entry, having the capacity to add an entry relationship to a procedure uh, to indicate this is a useful thing, but we also see value in having a way to discreetly link procedures to results. Um, and right now, um, I don't know if everyone's aware, uh, CCDA itself doesn't actually offer any guidance on how to do that. And if folks, um, there weren't too many other vendors uh, in the breakout room, but if folks have um, opinions of like how, if at all they implement it, that right now, I'd be super interested in hearing that. Um, because um, I know Epic um, doesn't actually um, use the entry reference template or anything to do that right now. Um, but we got to talking about, you know, that's a useful thing to do. Uh, the entry reference template in CCDA does exist, and linking a procedure to a result like that theoretically should be as simple as just, you know, you find the result organizer's ID. Uh, stick it in this template in a procedure. And then the expert mode way to read a procedure as unsuccessful would be look at the procedure, go into the entry relationship, find the ID, resolve the ID by looking at a result organizer somewhere else in the document that has it, and then looking at the result observation for that result, which would have theoretically a value of, you know, unsuccessful or something like that. Um, Given the much higher level of complexity in doing that, you know, that's sort of why we figure it's definitely worth having something on the procedure itself. But we kind of agreed that the long-term thing that would be nice to work towards here would be having guidance for every step of the process up to and including, you know, doing it the way I just described, where you can read all the way to the result observation and figure out that the procedure was unsuccessful that way. Um, so the immediate follow-up that I hope we can, you know, get done in the next couple of weeks or so is go to the example task force <coughs> and approve having the entry relationship on a procedure. Um, like I said, theoretically, um, linking a procedure to a result shouldn't even be that complicated. We do have the CCDA template for it. Uh, but I expect that um, once we actually get into discussing that, it might get a little more complicated. Um, and again, especially if you um, are doing CC implementation stuff today and have any thoughts about that, um, please uh, reach out to me. I'd be super interested in hearing them. So if I can, I'll, there's one additional kind of two things that to clarify. So one was, I think we talked about the idea that it, and I don't know if, if, if this would be something that we'd say must, shall, right, kind of thing. I think that's a little too strong, but that um, using this entry relationship is, is a good thing. And if you also do the result that you probably should do this too, right? So there's consistency with regards to always being able to kind of find this sort of thing here. The other part was that that particular code that we picked, that is uh, procedure, failed attempted procedure. Uh, interestingly, it's actually a, a grouper. It's got a whole mess of uh, more specific failed procedures underneath it. Obviously not all of them. In fact, not one that speaks to a failed x-ray. But it kind of points out that 
if you do what we just said, so you would have a failed procedure, you would create this injury relationship at the on the procedure. You would also link the result because there could, I think, frequently be a result. And that result then could say something that either potentially could be a child of this one or something else. But um, the, the point being that the result actually could have something more specific associated with it, number one. And then the last thing, uh, or two, is that this procedure um, could have, you know, as, as Dave Carlson has mentioned, you know, maybe there's a couple of things that, that were completed. And if somebody wanted to be really thorough and say, well, you know, we got this part, this part done, but this part wasn't done, um, you know, you would have the ability to link through and see which parts were done, which ones weren't, even though it was overall fail procedure. Yeah, but in many cases, you're not going to have a result with a failed procedure, right? I mean, you're not, there's no result to a failed intubation <laughs> other than you try again. Other than you failed the, the intubation. And, and, and I think, yeah, with this one, uh, intubation, you would just have this and that would be enough. But there's the possibility that there'd be more kind of nuance that you would want to say and you could link that into the result. The, I, you know, the, the other part that I made before and I, I, I guess I still want to say here is is that I'm still concerned about how we display this stuff to clinicians and folks who are you know and systems that might be designed around the idea that you get a procedure and you have a result and that's what they display they don't have a way of displaying other things one you know how they do that really isn't in our purview but you know they'd have to be able to identify that there was something that was ordered you know and started Right, that's our key part. Was started in some way, but not completed, and um, and so they will either need to take this into a relationship if nothing else exists and put it someplace where they're looking and display that procedure that that procedure actually was started but failed. All right. Jigina, do you have enough for the notes or do you need them to send you? Uh, just as a blanket statement, if you had examples, if you could send me either the link or the, uh, the actual example file itself, that would be great. Yeah, um, I'll turn this into a proper thing on GitHub uh, so we can talk about the example task force and I'll email you the link, Jigina. Perfect, thank you. All right, anything else on that? No? All right, the eye care physical exam, the only group to meet uh, all day. All right, so Thank I'm you. gonna start. Um, I think I'll, I'll start with like a brief summary of kind of what the team went through and what we did. And then um, Dennis Ball is going to uh, show some XML and we'll uh, have Dr. Jim Grew close, Jim close for us. Um, as the, the final step. I'm going to just share my screen. Okay, so for the eye care use case, um, we examined the problem basically that, that eye care has largely been left out of consolidated CDA and US CDI and there really isn't enough good guidance for data exchange of the kind of um, information that um, eye care really needs to share. And Dr. Grew, uh, Jim um, mentioned the number one pain point kind of got us focused around goal for the day was getting the visual acuity and the refraction measurements in a progress note so that it could be shared from an optometrist back to an ophthalmologist surgeon um, when they're co-managing a patient, sort of the challenge to try and meet. Talked about some key document types, using just um, common language to refer to the document types, kind of brought us into a discussion about what really are the CCDA document types that we wanted to focus on. And we um, had a good discussion kind of top down, got agreement around document types, progress note, 
the referral note and consultation note is very important, especially in this co-managing kind of situation to um, ask for a patient to receive some services from somebody else and get information back about how that's going, how that went. And then the operative note, because there's a um, very common procedure like a cataract replacement that this is important for. Um, the next thing we did is we jumped into kind of focusing on the key data elements. So visual acuity and ref refraction was what we focused on um, because of Jim's challenge. But we just let ourselves kind of think about all kinds of other data elements that are on our wish list. Um, some of them we really kind of placed off our plate, but we got stuck around this idea of, you know, really struggling on how do we represent the different nature of things, procedures versus tests, results, physical exam, um, the encounter section, this kind of thing. That's about when we broke for lunch and you got it, guys helped us with this big question about how do we figure out, how do we know what should go where. And after we got back from the break, we had um, a little bit of a, a, a discussion to use some of the information that was gained there, and we put forward a proposal that we were able to um, wordsmith together a couple iterations of people like add this, change something, and we developed a basic working assumption that allowed us to kind of get unstuck from that perplexing question and uh, settled on an idea that if what's performed has a CPT code that would be billed, not including evaluation and management and eye exam codes, um, we would create a procedure in the procedure section and then use a result observation in the result section to record the associated result. And then we would put all the eye care results from the visit in a single result organizer in the result section. That's how we'd kind of handle that. Maybe a bonus to link that result observation to the associated procedure activity procedure and, um, and maybe back the other way but we would put all of the other observations into the physical exam section with an eye care sort of subsection. And coming to this agreement kind of made everybody feel resolved about this outstanding confusing point. We were able to make better progress after that. Um, a focus came up on an interesting key point around the importance of the consumption of the information, not just the creation of it. And the group spent some time talking about um, what can we assume, what can we know or not know about how the documents are going to be consumed. And then um, we started getting bogged down as we shifted to think about creating XML. We were thinking about the different structural possibilities, how to organize the information between sections, subsections, organizers, observations, all of that. And we got, we got really bogged down because we were just thinking about what are the logical possibilities of combining and recombining in all these different ways. And then we had this aha moment where we said, you know, it really doesn't matter how we package this data up for shipping, for exchange, what really matters, because it can be unpacked and displayed however a system wants to display it. But the important thing is that recipients want to see the information in some sort of logical or customary expected kind of order. And that was a real breakthrough for us. When the group got here, um, we decided to start focusing on what users wanted to see first. Um, uh, I think we, uh, Robin or somebody used the term, let's focus on the UI first, and then design the entries that could hold that data in some reasonable package it up way um, as, a second, as a second phase. And so um, p folks started uh, pulling out examples and samples. Robin offered some examples of how this is done in, in iFinity. And Randy had a cool style sheet that showed how this kind of data is typically organized and, and uh, shown to users who are comfortable with it. Robin did a kind of a full-blown, like, let's populate everything and see what the maximum view is. And then we were able to really rapidly get on board with some um, down and dirty modeling in section.txt just using our basic HTML tags that are available to replicate what people wanted to see. And once we got here, we were really close to understanding, hey, we've got some really reasonable ways to package this stuff up. And that's how we backed into 
the idea based on guidance um, both in consolidated CDA and some deeper guidance from IHE that the physical exam section is really designed not just to be a big giant um, dumping ground but to have subsections that are organized by the, the parts of the body that might have a physical exam associated with them. And so we went with um, a one level of nesting that would have the section and then this the subsection construct to it so that we could get the um, use the vocabulary that was suggested by IHE to have some standardized kind of set, sets, uh, a sense of what the subsections would be. And then we used our basic result organizer using the code of the organizer to say what we're talking about and then the individual result observations um, with both a, a code for like visual acuity is uncorrected and a target body site to represent the left eye or the right eye or both eyes and then of course the value to hold the value. Um, we were able to replicate that for the two key data elements that we picked out and um, we were just really left with some kind of like finish up work to go back over and think about correct units of measure. We had some conversation about um, units of measure that are used in um, non-US as well as US units and agreed that everything that we had done would um, suit would be very well suited for regardless of what the units of measure were. So it's not just a US focused kind of solution. It could work in other parts of the world. And uh, we realized that we kind of have to go back over and refine. We didn't really talk about specific details around provenance things like effective time, um, author, you know, how to, how to get to some of those things. But we made really good progress. And I'm going to uh, turn the screen over to Dennis to show the, uh, the XML. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> so this is the, the report that uh, um, of the sections that we talked about. So I'll go before the XML, I'll show Randy put together all the different types of sections that we would want to put into the physical exam. And as Lisa said, we had some difficulty determining, you know, what's the procedure, what should go in results, and what should go in the physical exam. So in the XML, um, originally we started, and, and there's obviously phase two, and there's more work to be done. We had put subsections in. So we have physical exam, which is part of the E&M coding for optometry and ophthalmology. And then we had the physical findings of the eye. And then, of course, under there, we're going to have result organizers and result observations, which will dictate all the different sections like visual acuities and um, you know, obviously refraction measurements. So I'll render this and basically, as Lisa said, we tried to concentrate on how to make it look. So we still have to go back and do all the result um, observations and organizations, but this is how we came up with a view and again, we won't be using subsections, but this is a view of how we wanted the data to look in the, the narrative format. And now I'm gonna go back in and we're gonna put some result organizer and structure to all the values underneath. Did that cover everything, Lisa? Or do you want yeah, some more? Yeah, that's, that's great. It was, it was a, for a ton of stuff, it was pretty painless. J Jim, do you wanna close just in terms of perceptions um, on how the day went and what we were able to accomplish? Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think eye care, like Lisa said, eye care really hasn't been part of the process in an organized fashion through the way that HL7 works. And I think what today showed everybody was the value in this collaborative process of working together. I think everybody would agree that by having, you know, multiple EHRs sitting down and working through these issues together, as well as some administrative people and other people, we made progress that everybody would have struggled and probably couldn't got past. So that was important. Uh, and I think everybody sees the value in continuing this process because we've really only looked at a couple of items. There's a lot more data that we need to figure out how to share. Uh, and everybody's in agreement that, you know, we need to get more EHRs. We need to expand this process. So um, I would say there was pretty much complete agreement that we need to figure out some way to continue this. And one of the things that I think is key is we all need to go back to our organizations and show some sort of success. So the plan is to have Dennis and Lisa finish the template guidelines for this, distribute it to everybody that was participating in the process, 
uh, and in some part of that process, we need to uh, serve as a resource. So as the EHRs take this and they try to implement it, they have somebody they can call, whether it's Lisa or whatever, to get questions answered. Then as each of those EHRs get this implemented, we need to put together a, a sort of a mini connectathon so we can actually test the results. And if we could do that and get this working and get it into the EHRs and all the people participating could go back and show it to their companies and the people they influence, we think we could uh, substantially expand this process and keep it going. That's great. Do you have anything you a lot of this work and and see the benefit of it. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been a long process, and I mean, we've seen documents in the eye care, and I don't know if Jim mentioned this, but you know, there's a lot of data, like posterior segment, anterior segment. All this data is just being thrown into narratives. It's not consumable. It's not really usable from a machine readable point of view. And with the 21st Century Cures Act and all the interoperability, you know, strides that have been you know, taking many steps forward to try and improve the process, you know, the eye care industry really hasn't, you know, done anything to try and move forward. And hopefully we can do that. Yeah. And one of the things that I think was pretty obvious is some of the people, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of expertise that somebody like Lisa has, right? We all recognize that. So she was an amazing leader in the process. Uh, and Dennis's expertise of what he's done, you know, allowed us to quickly put this together. But what was important is people that were involved in the process that have really never been involved in this process at all were major contributors to moving this ahead. And I think that was, that was important for everybody to see. Yeah, I've never experienced progress happen that fast. And having the experienced domain experts um, working right there with us side by side <clears throat> made all the difference. You know, there were some like more theoretical conversations that were had and then and then really practical ones that got us on to legitimate examples where people had a strong sense of what's right, what's wrong, what's expected, um, what's possible. And that was really what allowed us to go so much faster. So I guess one of the takeaways from this that I would like to see is if we could get some guidance from HL7 on how we can work as a sort of eye care group to, to keep making progress and potentially do it within the HL7 structure. That yeah. would be valuable. Right. Okay. Yeah. Anything else from that group? Uh, no, I think that was it. I think just here's all the different sections that we need to sort of take care of within the, the physical exam um, that Randy put together. So there's a lot of data that can be captured, you know, one to support the clinical notes and all the different exports, but uh, to just further get data that's machine readable. So, no, nope, that's it. Thank you, Gene. I, I think I just wanted to say I, I felt like there was really positive energy and a couple of the folks said like they'd be dancing in the street to get CDAs that looked like this. And that's why we renamed ourselves the Dancing Visionaries. Um, but it was uh, a, a, a wonderful experience. And um, I think we should just take a note that this was a really positive way to use day two of the IAT and something that we could uh, build upon. Sure, and that's actually a great segue into, um, you know, just a reflection on the event. Um, obviously, we had sort of our standard day one yesterday. Um, um, we did do a couple survey polls, but I think that Dave Hamill's going to send out a survey. We don't have a survey on, we didn't have a poll ready for today. Um, I think I dropped in, you know, obviously I was leading a session or was working on a session in the morning, but in the afternoon, I dropped into the two different sessions and it sounded like you guys were getting some great work. So yeah, for in cases where we have a problem to be solved, um, this seems like a fantastic uh, venue for that. So we will certainly for the next IAT look towards keeping this. Um, does anyone have any comments, you know, in general on today's sessions and how they worked and what, what you thought about them that you're willing to share? You're going to keep them for the anonymous yeah. surveys. That's okay. Yeah. Well, it, it definitely keeps you on your toes and having to, 
to produce something that you want to show to the group and progress it you know everyone's gonna have to sharpen their xml skills but uh, mm -hmm. no it, i think it was a great addition it, it did, definitely got more people involved and you know sometimes you go through an iat and not a lot of people will speak up but i think we were able to get everybody in the group for the eye care one eventually uh, at least to participate well, that's wonderful that's great I think for me, the only thing uh, is the, the date. Um, some of you may know it's the, the MIPS deadline was today. Um, and so there were some EHR companies that wanted to come, but they would, weren't able to attend because the same people that handle this also are dealing with last minute emergencies. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have that. I mean, the IT and the connectathons, we have, there's, you, there's never seems to be the perfect time frame for it. So. But if you're yeah. tapped into that schedule, could you take a quick look at July um, and look at the two weeks in July at the end of July and let us know if there would be some sort of deadline, like like anything like that that you know of that could be a competing um, stressor? Yeah, we're looking at the last two weeks of July and trying to decide between those two weeks for what would be a good time for a good week for the IAT. Yeah, nothing in terms of the, the MIP side, really. It's the last couple of weeks of the end of the year and the last couple of weeks of the end of March are the, the big times. Right. Let's cool. note yeah. that in the minutes to avoid last couple of weeks of March, if, if possible, for next time, for next year. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Randy. Um, there aren't any other really big deadlines, and I can't think of any big society meetings that would take um, EHRs out that are in July either. So, I have my calendar flagged for Tuesday, July 19th through Thursday, July 21st, first as the CMS Connectathon. So I know that's fire, but you might, if you do it, then you might be overlapping with that. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. So that, that was the 19th to the 21st? 19th to 21st. I'm not sure where I got that date from, but it's on my calendar. So I'm, I'm going to assume it's accurate. I'm going to check mine, Becky, because I think I have a different one that I, I heard about just maybe like only a week ago. So, let, so okay. let me just check and see if it's different. All right. I have Any July, other... yeah, July 19 through 22, CMS connect us on. Okay, well then let's not do the IET that week then. Yep. Any other comments on uh, the last two days? I think this has been another fantastic IET. I'm glad that we got some new people involved and um, we got some really good sessions. So thank you, I've got the slide up. Thank you obviously to the ONC again for their continued support of the IET. Um, Please join us again for next, the July one. If you have any suggestions, there's the Confluence page that um, we can make suggestions. In terms of the notes um, for this IT, uh, Jaginder uh, works on them and someone was asked about the recordings, we get the recordings. So you can look to next week, we'll have the notes all completed for people to review and for the recordings to be made available. Anyone on the team have anything else to add? I just want to say for, this is my first time in an IET and I thought it was fabulous. I've been in fire connectathons and I've struggled where to fit in when I don't have a system, but I represent the nutrition space. So I thought this was really great as a way for me um, to work on the standards and help advance them. I also wanted to add at the end of the breakout with the eye care group, they were concerned about how to get things into HL7 and do it in there. So I wanted to mention that to the larger group. Lisa, I don't know if you can help them or um, I think I saw Gay drop because, you know, if they're trying to do a structured doc that or try to do CCDA, do they need to spin up a project with the structured docs work group to kind of keep momentum with what they were doing? You know, it's a, it's a great question, Becky. And, and one of the things John Demore um, who is now uh, an active member on the CDA management group has been rallying for, and he's got my my wheels turning thinking in the same way, is that when groups are able to come forward and provide examples that use all existing templates and really are just um, showing how, 
the exi existing templates can be used to accomplish different things, that that's, we don't really have to stand up a project to do that. That's just um, uh, coming to examples task force, bringing examples. You don't have to always prepare your examples in the task force. We just have kind of a review vetting process that allows you to bring work into the examples task force. There's a pretty group, a good group of heavy hitters in the XML and CDA space that kind of review and 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 um, stress test the example, make sure that it looks as as right as possible, get it into GitHub and stuff like that, and then we bring it to Structured Docs with a recommendation to be approved, and it's that easy. So I I don't think it I don't really think it takes a heavier lift than that, and I'm not sure what the rules are around non-HL7 members helping to make samples that get brought before the, the task force. I can bring that up with Brett and just, you know, kind of clarify that, that path. But um, the accelerator groups are full of non-HL7 members I was that say, are HL7... creating stuff to help make things go faster. So I don't think that's going to be a problem. And I thought the paid membership is only for voting, whereas you can have the membership that's just free and participate in standards development. Yeah, it'd be totally fine. Yeah, what, what you would need to do, though, is in order to vote on a standard, you would end up also having to pay. But in terms of creating content, absolutely do not need to pay. All right, well then, I will, on that note, I will uh, close. I see people are having to drop off. So thank you guys very much. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys again in July, assuming Jaginder and I continue to do this. It's getting, it's, uh, it's a long haul. This is fun. Um, if you have anything, if you think of anything, you can drop Dave or Lisa or Jaginder I a note, an email, but otherwise uh, look for the notes to be finished next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great evening. Bye.